So good afternoon. I'm Stephen Richardson from Howard University. And it's my pleasure to introduce Charles Brown II as our Sequent Quantum and Materials Devices Seminar speaker today. Charles is currently a Ford Foundation postdoctoral fellow at UC Berkeley, where he's working with Dan Samper Kern on experimental studies of ultra cold atoms in various optical lattice geometries. Charles earned his bachelor's degree with honors in physics at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, and he obtained his PhD in physics from Yale, working with Jack Harris on superfluid helium field optical cavities and magnetically levitated drops of superfluid helium and vacuum. While at Yale, Charles was an NSF graduate research fellow and a D. Allen Bromley fellow for graduate physics research. Last November, Charles was selected as a winner of the Quantum Creators Prize at the University of Chicago in recognition of his achievements as an early career researcher in quantum science and engineering. Outside of his lab work, Charles is a co-founder of Hashtag Black in Physics, which is dedicated to celebrating the historical contributions of Black physicists in an effort to paint a more diverse picture of what physicists look like. He is passionate about his important work on this issue. And this work has resulted in many articles in physics today in physics world on the contributions of black physicists, both past and present. And I'm happy to announce, I just learned a few minutes ago that as of uh, next January, 2023, Charles will be joining the faculty at Yale as an assistant professor. Charles's talk today is entitled Probe of Band Structure Singularities with a Lattice Trapped Quantum Gas. Charles. All right. Okay, so first, uh, thank you for the very nice introduction. Um, very, you know, happy to be a part of this, this seminar series. Uh, it seems sort of special for me as a cold atom person to get the opportunity to tell you about my work and the kind of work that we do and to draw connections between ultra cold atom physics and condensed matter or solid state physics. Um, and so today I'm going to tell you about our recent probe of band structure singularities with the lattice trapped quantum gas. Um, and in trying to tell you about this work, uh, I've really tried hard to draw parallels between the work of cold atoms and lattices to uh, the solid state systems that uh, a lot of this uh, community is more used to talking about. And in order to do that, I'm really going to tell you a story about quantum simulation. Um, so as I like to define it, quantum simulation is uh, mimicking quantum systems for the purpose of understanding their states, phases, and dynamics. And so in general, you might be able to write down a Hamiltonian that looks like this, that has some generic uh, kinetic energy, some generic potential energy, and importantly, some interaction energy, some interaction terms. And uh, as is often the case, this, um, this term in the expression of the Hamiltonian can be quite complicated. And so that might not uh, lend itself to being able to solve outright. And so you may need to simulate the dynamics of this Hamiltonian. And when I think about it, um, you know, I like to classify this in two different ways. You can do digital simulation, uh, which I would say requires a, you know, a proper quantum computer device, something like what Google or IBM or Honeywell or IronQ has, um, where you need to initialize a state, you perform some quantum algorithm, which is to say you implement a series of gates or transformations on some collection of qubits, and you perform a measurement to get a result. As opposed to analog simulation, which is what I do, where you use cold atoms and lattices, for example, or trapped ion chains, or uh, Rydberg tweezer arrays, or even all photonic systems to be able to uh, solve some interesting Hamiltonian that you want to know, uh, uh, at least a way to know how that Hamiltonian causes a system to, to evolve. And when you dig into it, I think that there's sort of two main classes that quantum simulation, at least experimentally, have already attacked. And, and have answered lots of important questions uh, under, and that would be like time dependent problems or ground state problems. Uh, where under time dependent problems, for example, you can study things like equilibration and thermalization, where the authors here uh, sort of, you know, slosh all of their 
uh, atoms in a lattice to one side of this lattice structure and um, measure as a function of time how the density of the atoms changes throughout the lattice as it sort of relaxes. Or doing things like studying dynamical phase transitions or even uh, doing slow quenches through um, fast or slow quenches um, through a, a phase transition, where in this work, the authors study how uh, excitations in the form of vortices appear in uh, superfluid as you uh, cross the, the, the phase transition threshold, or even kick systems, so case systems, where you know there's really a whole wide array of physics uh, that you can study by introducing some, you know, some periodic uh, time-dependent energy term in your Hamiltonian. Or looking at the ground state problem side of things, where you can uh, learn a bit about quantum magnetism. Uh, here, this is sort of a, uh, an illustration of what a quantum antiferromagnet might look like. And here is a, a picture of that antiferromagnet uh, using ultra cold atoms in an optical lattice, where um, the researchers have single site resolution. This is from the same Bakker's group at Princeton. Or studying quantum spin liquids, like in the, uh, the Harvard MIT collaboration. Um, uh, between Lukens, Lutich, Greiner, et cetera, or even being able to uh, study superconductivity. Okay, uh, so even though I've just, you know, named a lot of uh, Knitz matter type of physics, uh, I want to point this out. I know this is a talk about quantum materials and devices, but I think it's really important. Uh, quantum simulation experiments may provide insight on problems in particle physics. Uh, here I've shown uh, a lattice where the little dots are atoms, and the red arrows emerging from the lattice plane uh, are illustrations of a synthetic gauge field, right? So in, cold, in the cold atom world, we have ways of manipulating our lattice to make it to make the, the particles in the lattice feel like they have some gauge field, like a magnetic field, maybe perpendicular to the lattice plane, or maybe even the end plane, or some other angle. Right? Now this is interesting because uh, high energy physics tells us that gauge fields are ubiquitous in nature. Um, the gauge field for, uh, for, well, for electromagnetism, the gauge field is a photon, the strong force is the gluon, the weak force is the W and G particles, right? And so I mentioned we have a way to generate synthetic gauge fields. We can do this by something we call lattice shaking, or maybe something, this other technique called laser assisted tunneling. But never, nevertheless, we're moving to this regime where we might be able to make proper time-dependent artificial gauge fields, right? This would be a dynamical gauge field, and this would start to look like quantum field theories. And so maybe using cold atoms and an optical lattice might be a way to learn something about uh, quantum field theories in the future. Okay, but enough about that. Um, the reason why we want to study, we want to simulate uh, solid state systems is because there are many exciting questions on exotic superconductivity and magnetism, quantum Hall effects, a whole host of topological matter, et cetera. And an ultra cold atom quantum simulator, like the one I'm going to tell you about today, offers several advantages in that the defects are controllable. We have long lived quantum coherence. We can uh, prepare many copies of our system. And we have a sort of unique ability to study uh, out of equilibrium physics, given the, the sort of experimental knobs we have access to. Okay. And so, you know, we can provide great insight into the behavior of solid materials with crystalline lattice structure. And this is an image of uh, doing diffraction from an optical honeycomb lattice. So similar to how a crystallographer might do X-ray diffraction um, or you know, electron diffraction of some materials, we can uh, do diffraction of our, uh, our cold atoms from our lattices and study the properties of the atoms in the lattice in this way. Okay, and so uh, you know, I, uh, I don't want to preach to the choir here. I know a lot of people in the audience or the people that watch the series will be quite familiar with uh, lattices, but I sort of want to talk about the salient parts of our quantum simulator, that is the lattice and the atoms. And I want to hit, point, hit home some important points about band structure. And so in doing that, I'm going to go ahead and run through some basics of crystalline lattices. Right? Uh, so I like to define a crystalline lattice as a periodic set of points that have some set of symmetries. Right? So you can have, for example, a square lattice, which has translation symmetry. That's what makes it a crystal. That is, uh, if I sort of look at this dot and I move over by one of these distances between two adjacent dots, the lattice looks the same. It also has some set of rotation symmetries. 
Uh, this one has a fourfold rotation symmetry or a 90 degree rotation symmetry. That is, if I rotate this lattice by 90 degrees, the lattice looks exactly the same. And of course, there are other lattices. Triangular lattice, the, the, the triangular lattice has translation symmetry, a different rotation symmetry. The Kagome lattice also has translation symmetry, uh, its own set of rotation symmetries. This is near and dear to our heart in the Stanford Kern group, uh, given that we like to study flat band physics in the Kagome lattice. Uh, but of course, what's common to all lattices is that they have band structure. Uh, so here, what I'm showing is a quick slice of uh, one dimensional uh, band structure where I plot the energy of particles in the lattice versus their in lattice momentum. In two different cases, one case where the particles experience no attraction to the lattice sites, that's the light equals zero, compared to the case where they actually do feel attraction to the lattice sites. In the case where they feel no attraction to the lattice sites, then the, uh, the dispersion relation, the, the relationship between the energy and momentum is what you would expect. It's quadratic. That is, the, that is what you're seeing in this series of parabola. Uh, but in the case where the atoms actually start to fill the lattice, then what you find is that band gaps emerge. And so now the uh, particles are not allowed to have an arbitrary energy. Uh, they can only have energies that fall within these bands, the green band, the blue band, or the peak band. And they're forbidden to have energies that are in the, the white regions. Okay, and so we know that a uh, solid band structure describes the allowable energy levels for electrons in a crystal lattice, right? Uh, in the solid state, I guess I already mentioned solid. Um, and it's the case that the band structure explains material properties, like, for example, electrical resistivity or optical absorption. And it's useful in trying to, um, to describe these properties, thinking about these uh, so-called block wave functions where you have some, um, some uh, cell periodic part, this U of R, and some phase. And with the important condition, uh, periodic boundary conditions, namely, uh, which suggests that this function U is the same at some position R uh, as it is at that position R plus this uh, vector R, which is the, the lattice vector. This is sort of the spacing between the, the lattice points, okay? There we go. But uh, as it turns out, there, there's another important concept uh, that is necessary to understand more fully the properties of a material. And that is also the geometry uh, and topology of the state space, uh, where the wave functions live that describe the particles in the lattice. And so if you want to understand more exotic physics effects like quantum Hall effects or orbital magnetism or topological insulators, you need to start to understand the geometry and topology of the state space. And one way to learn about that is through the Berry connection, right? If you look at this, this is effectively the expectation value of the momentum operator in momentum space. Uh, but really it tells you a lot about how different states are connected through interesting geometric or topological aspects of the Hilbert space. Okay, and I'm gonna uh, show you an example uh, of exactly that uh, later in this talk. Okay, um, so that tells you everything I want to let you know about uh, my take on lattices and sort of where I'm heading. Uh, I mentioned that I wanted to talk to you about our particles. So in the solid state, the particles you care about are electrons. For us, they are rubidium atoms, okay? Uh, so unlike electrons, which are fermions, which in many materials are degenerate Fermi gases, we use Bose-Einstein condensates, right? So uh, the important way, at least in, in, this, uh, in this science, to think about the difference is by looking at what happens when you harmonically trap bosons versus fermions, even at zero temperature. Because of Pauli exclusion, you find that among the different levels of the harmonic oscillator, fermions will stack up to some Fermi energy versus bosons, which are happy to cloud down into this lower energy level. This is how we make our boson sign compensate, by trapping it, by cooling it, allowing it to uh, pool into this lowest energy level. Right? And so I'll say a little bit about this boson sign compensate. Uh, in this boson sign compensate, it's useful to think about the de Broglie wavelength. Right? This is what describes the wave-like behavior of matter. Uh, you find that the de Broglie wavelength is inversely proportional to mass uh, and temperature. Okay, and so, um, you find that when the temperature of your sample is low enough, 
So the Broglie wavelengths can become, or the, so the Broglie wavelengths can be become larger than the space between particles, or rather the, the volume associated with the Broglie wavelength lambda cubed can be uh, greater than the sort of average volume per particle. Now you have a situation where the wave functions sort of uh, overlap and, and now you've gone through some uh, phase transition and you have this, this Bose-Einstein condensate that has a unique, very unique set of properties. Uh, this is an old image from uh, Gila slash NIST slash CD Boulder uh, showing the onset of Bose-Einstein condensation where you see as the gas is cooled uh, from left to right, you see a peak appear at zero momentum, right? This uh, peak growing becoming sharper at what I'm telling you is zero momentum. This is the onset of Bose-Einstein condensation. Uh, now, normally, um, you know, we're familiar with the Schrodinger equation, which has some kinetic and potential energy terms. The, instead, you use the gross tetevsky equation to talk about Bose-Einstein condensates that just have some interaction energy. Uh, but the important thing here is that the, the evolution of, the, of this system now depends on the density psi squared, right? Okay. And I just wanted to show a quick picture of a Bose-Einstein condensate from our lab. These are typical, typically around 100 nanokelvin or so, but again, we, we use uh, Bose-Einstein condensates of rubidium. Okay, so uh, let me get into our, our actual optical lattice. Uh, mathematically, uh, you can make a standing wave by having two counterpropagating uh, traveling waves. The blue and the red counterpropagating waves, as you see, make a black uh, standing wave. Experimentally, we can do this by sending two counterpropagating lasers directly at each other. And if you look at the sort of intersection uh, and you look at the time average electric field intensity, what you find is a standing wave, perfectly periodic, with half with the spacing that's half of the laser wavelength, into which I can throw my atoms. Okay. Now we can use multiple pairs of intersecting beams to make either two-dimensional or three-dimensional lattices. And that's exactly what we do in order to make an optical honeycomb lattice. Right. So in uh, this work I'm gonna to talk to you about today, we study an ultra cold atom analog of graphene, where we can send three lasers at each other uh, in this orientation separated by 120 degrees in a plane uh, with in-plane polarization, like field polarization. And what you find, if you look at the overlap region and you, you look at the, the potential energy landscape that the atoms experience, you would see something like this, where I've marked the local potential energy minima using green dots. And as you can see, this makes a honeycomb lattice. Okay. Uh, I've also shown the lattice vectors here. Um, so, you know, these are lattice vectors that we can use to span the honeycomb lattice. Your uh, unit cell, of course, is this two site object here. And I can uh, translate that unit cell around by these uh, unit vectors to span the honeycomb lattice. And I want to point this out because we're actually going to use this concept to describe how we actually translate our lattice. And we, we use this to navigate our atoms or to evolve our atoms through momentum space. Okay. Uh, now let me pay a little homage to graphene. Uh, I think you know the audience here uh, must have a special fondness for graphene. It's a very important material. It has been in the last decade and, and it will continue to be because we're still learning new stuff about it. Um, again, I want to stress that a crystal's band structure and the geometry and topology of state space determines its properties. Um, this was very nicely discovered quite a while ago now with uh, graphene, given the 2010 Nobel Prize, this single layer sheet of carbon atoms. Um, and, you know, while graphene has many interesting properties, one thing that really sticks out to me about graphene is that it has these direct singular points. So if you look at the band structure of graphene here, you find that at the K points, you have direct points, these regions where the band structure or the, the gap between the adjacent bands grows linearly in quasi momentum. Associated with that direct point is interesting uh, barrier or geometric phase. And in uh, graphene, this is associated with Klein tunneling where electrons can tunnel through ostensibly too large of um, potential barriers or even the half integer uh, quantum Hall effect. Um, and of course, I, you know, there are sort of more, uh, more advanced systems like twisted bilayer graphene with their associated more patterns that have uh, touching points of various degree. Uh, and these are all associated with interesting topological properties of these materials. And so I wanted to say here that my artificial graphene I'm gonna tell you about, it also has direct points with interesting topological properties. It, it doesn't only have direct points, so it also has quadratic band touching points. And that's part of 
the you know special thing that I want to describe to you today in, in the experiments. Okay, and so before I get into the uh, actual experiments and, and data that I want to describe, I wanted to uh, give a look into our experimental setup. Um, so this is pretty common for an ultra cold atom uh, setup. You typically need some sort of light preparation table. Uh, this light preparation table is going to produce all of the uh, laser light that you need to manipulate an atom. For us in this experiment, the atom is rubidium, and so we use this table to make all the light we need to cool and trap rubidium atoms. Uh, a lot of this light gets sent through optical fibers over to this other table. There's actually only a small part of the table, uh, but sort of the, the important parts are here. Uh, eventually, we end up producing a Bose-Einstein condensate in this region, and we also send our laser beams into this region. So there's one laser that comes from here, one that comes from here, one that comes from here. Those are the three lasers that make up the lattice, okay? The vertical breadboard that you see is how we do our imaging. So we shine a laser from top down onto the atoms and we do absorption imaging. So essentially we project the shadow of the atoms onto a camera at the lowest level of the table. And that's how we collect all of the um, images that I'm gonna show you today all of our data that I'm going to show you today. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me start to jump into some of the physics that I want to talk about. Um, here I'm showing the band structure uh, calculated using tight binding for uh, our optical honeycomb lattice. As I mentioned, at the K points, just like graphing, um, there's a linear band touching point, which is a direct point, but also in the next higher set of bands, the P bands of our lattice, uh, we have access to these uh, because we don't have a lot of S and P band uh, hybridization issues. And so we can really isolate the P bands of our lattice in a, in a, or of the P bands of, of the system in this optical lattice. Uh, you see that at gamma, there's a quadratic band touching point. And so uh, I'm gonna show you studies of both of these kinds of band touching points today. Now, regarding Dirac points in coal atom systems, uh, we are not the first to characterize them. We've just characterized them in a different way. There's been a lot of really uh, awesome work done on ultra cold atoms studying Dirac points. Where here uh, in this work from this 2015 science paper, uh, the authors show that as they uh, evolve their atoms around loops, such as this red diamond, that uh, um, encircles one of the direct points at K or at K prime, they see a uh, phase jump of their atoms of pi, right? This is what you would expect uh, from encircling direct point, given that uh, direct points are known to have confined to them uh, Berry curvature and to be associated with a pi Berry phase. Um, you can also think of this as having, being uh, topologically non-trivial with a winding number of one, okay? Uh, in other cold atom work, uh, sort of in a similar sense, evolving atoms through Dirac points have shown that uh, in this optical lattice, where the two sides of the unit cell uh, are, are equally deep, like graphene, you see a, a phase jump of pi when you uh, evolve the atoms through the, um, through the Dirac point. And you don't see this when you, um, when you change the, the relative depth of the A and B sites. Uh, that's what's being shown here, which makes the uh, lattice more like hexagonal boron nitride instead of graphene. And this is sort of what you would expect because doing so opens up a gap. Uh, and so, you know, you, you lose that topological interesting point at the, uh, at K or at the, yeah, at K, right? So you lose that direct point. Um, or other work where um, the researchers are able to do quantum state tomography throughout the Brillouin zone, showing that uh, at the K points here, here and here, you see a, uh, a sort of concentration of, of Berry curvature, okay? And similarly, uh, in, in, in similar work to, to this, um, another example of, of cold atom researchers being able to see that as you evolve through Dirac points, you get this sort of uh, pi phase jump. Okay, all right, so we know that we can do this, um, but 
instead of doing experiments where we, we loop around the direct points or the topologically interesting point, as is uh, normally done in cold atoms, we're going to evolve our atoms straight through the points and turn at some angle. Okay, so how do we do that? We well, already mentioned that we translate our lattice. Um, we can do this by just creating some phase differences between different pairs of the three laser beams that make the honeycomb lattice. We can give our lattice a velocity, V lat, that looks like this. So this is the uh, one of the unit vectors I told you about for our, our honeycomb lattice. This is the other one, this F12 and F23. These are just experimental control parameters. So I can make these time dependent, uh, arbitrarily so. And in that way, I can give the lattice an arbitrary velocity in two dimensions. Now, the quasi momentum of the atoms in the lattice is related to the velocity just by minus the single particle mass. And so because I can, um, I can give the lattice an arbitrary uh, velocity V, then in the lattice frame, the atoms can be given an arbitrary quasi momentum Q that we can control quite precisely, okay? And so let me show you some, uh, let me try to show you that we can indeed do this. Uh, here, these are diffraction images of atoms from our lattice. So we sort of shut the, the uh, we load the atoms into the lattice. Maybe we evolve their quasi momentum, maybe we don't. Uh, and then we shut the lattice off uh, quickly. And so we take these sorts of images. And if you just load the atoms to the lattice at uh, gamma, so in the, in the lowest band at gamma, two equals zero, uh, what you would expect is a diffraction image that looks like this. And indeed, this is precisely what we see. Um, or for another example, we can evolve the atoms, we can load the atoms into the lattice, evolve them from gamma to uh, this Q, uh, 1.33 times the distance between the gamma and K points in the first band. We can uh, look at what we expect the diffraction image to look like. And this is indeed what we see. So we do know that we can control the um, we can control the the quasi momentum of the atoms quite well. Okay. So with that, let me talk to you about um, a lot of the meat of what I wanted to describe to you today. Here's a zoom in of our band structure. This is where the direct point is that I want to investigate. I can start my atoms off at the gamma point and then zoom in the gamma point is somewhere outside of the circle, but know that I'm evolving from the gamma point over to K, the direct point, and I'm gonna turn at some angle theta, okay? I'm gonna do that um, many times for values all around this circle, uh, my mouse? for values all around this circle. And I'm gonna do what we call band mapping to measure uh, what is the proportion of atoms in the first or second band? Okay, so uh, that's what these images are. And I'm going to restate uh, what it is that we've done. We've evolved the atoms from the gamma point at momentum zero to the Dirac point, and we've turned by some angle theta. That angle is here, zero or pi over two or pi or three pi over two. What I'm showing you here are band mapping images that tell you about the proportion of atoms in the different bands. And I should say that this inner, this inner hexagon associated with the first Brillouin zone uh, allows us to read off the first band population or the, or the ground band population. This uh, outer star pattern is associated with the second Brillouin zone and that allows us to read off the proportion of atoms in the second band. This pattern here with these triangles, this one and this one and this one and this one, et cetera, tells us about the third band population. And so we can use these sorts of images with the overlaid um, Brillouin zone map to measure how many atoms we have uh, in each band as a function of turn angle. And so what you can see here is with zero turn angle, uh, essentially all the band, all of the atoms remain in the ground band, as opposed to uh, going straight through the Dirac point, that is a turn angle, a turn angle of pi, where most of the atoms end up in the second band. Or uh, also interestingly, a turn angle of pi over two, where the atoms end up essentially equally in the ground band, in this uh, hexagon here, in the second band, which allows us to make these actually superpositions of 
uh, band states. Okay, and so in this plot here, uh, what I've done is plot the proportion of atoms in say the ground band in the green dots versus the excited band in the blue dots as a function of this turn angle. And what you see is that as you do one revolution around the Dirac point, the atoms which were initially solely staying in the ground band do essentially a complete population inversion uh, to the second band, right? That is the blue circles. And then as I go back to two pi, so complete that full circle, uh, we find that the atoms again find themselves in the ground band. It's useful to think about this using a two band picture, uh, which is what you can normally do uh, when you have these two band systems. You can think of it as a pseudo spin picture, is uh, what I mean to say. So I can think of my system as a pseudo spin half in a pseudo magnetic field. Okay. That magnetic field, of course, grows linearly uh, away from the Dirac point. And so if I imagine that I start at gamma and I evolve over to the Dirac point, then um, we can say my, uh, my atoms are spin down and they're aligned with the magnetic field. But as soon as I cross the Dirac point and I turn some angle, now my spin down atoms are projected onto a new spin up and spin down basis. And so as soon as I turn and move away from the Dirac point, I now project my atoms into some superposition of the, the new spin up and spin down. Okay. Uh, I already mentioned the two band model. And I wanna mention that uh, these population dynamics are uh, driven by the Berry connection, right? So this is uh, the, the, the dynamics that you see here and, or the, the, the population dynamics, I wanna say, it's not a time dependent thing. It really is happening because there's, um, there's uh, something topologically interesting about the Dirac point that happens precisely at that point at K, okay? So again, this is driven by the off diagonal elements of the barrier connection, this AMN. Uh, this is also essentially a measure of quantum distance. Uh, this quantum distance d squared being defined as one minus the uh, absolute value squared of the, the cell periodic parts of the, of the uh, block wave function. And you can use the quantum distance to, to define the quantum metric tensor G, right? So this is the relation. So similar to how a relativist might write down a metric that defines distance in space time, you can write down a quantum metric that defines distance in Hilbert space. And while this may seem like some um, unusual abstraction, uh, it's actually quite interesting because we, we've known for a while that the Berry connection plays a very important role in physical material properties. Uh, the Berry connection is just one part of this quantity um, that you, the, the quantum geometric tensor. Right, so the barrier connection is the imaginary part of that tensor, and the quantum distance is the real part. And there's some um, a uh, series of interesting work, including um, a Nature paper from 2020 that shows uh, anomalous Landau level splitting uh, in a in a solid state system where the splitting of the Landau levels is precisely given by the quantum distance. And so my point for saying this is that this notion of quantum distance. Uh, we're, we're starting to understand more and more how it's important for describing uh, properties of materials. Okay. There we go. Okay. Let me see I'm doing the time. Okay, that's good. Uh, so this is uh, an interesting point, um, and it's the second to last point I want to tell you about the, the science that we've done. Uh, and that is, that is looking at the effective size of the direct points. Uh, so uh, what I want to describe here is a series of experiments where we evolve the atoms over multiple trajectories. All of the trajectories start at Q equals zero in the, in the ground band at this gamma point, you can say. And, they, uh, and we evolve the atoms to an adjacent gamma point in the momentum space. It's just that uh, we change the midpoint for all these trajectories. And so maybe one trajectory goes from gamma to K prime to gamma. The next trajectory goes from gamma to some distance away from this direct point back to gamma. The midpoint uh, trajectory goes from gamma to M to gamma, right? And so we do all of these trajectories 
and we uh, evolve the atoms over these trajectories as a function of time. And that's what, and the results of the, the proportion of atoms in different bands is what I'm plotting here, right? Uh, so uh, just to sort of reiterate, the vertical axis is the proportion of the atoms that remain in the ground band. We're just looking at how the atoms are arranged between the ground band and the excited band. And we look at it as a, sort of a function of the midpoint trajectory position. And we look at it for these different times. Okay, so what is it that, what is it that we see? Uh, we see that as we evolve the atoms over, um, over these trajectories, increasingly slowly, so going from this sort of blue to pink color, that is going from this blue to pink color. When we're on a trend, when we're on a trajectory where the midpoint is the endpoint, where there is a band, uh, there's a band gap between the ground and excited band, you see what you sort of expect from Landau Zener physics. You see that uh, as I uh, evolve the atoms more slowly, again, going from blue to pink, you see that more atoms are gonna stay in the ground band, right? Uh, I'm moving sort of less fast. I'm, mo I'm moving slower with respect to that band gap. And so you would expect there to be less uh, transition because of this reason. Okay, and this is quite different to what you see happening at the direct points here and here, where within the air bars, uh, there's essentially no variation in the population of atoms that remain in the first band if you go through K, right? So this is a deviation from Landau's inner physics. And this is a way that we can quantify the effective size of the direct point. So I can sort of set a threshold. That threshold I've set is 0 0.5. So I'm looking at uh, for which of these trajectories and at which times the uh, population of atoms in the ground band goes down to half, okay? And I can plot that as a function of time, okay? Uh, and that's what this inset is showing. So if I look at when that threshold is hit, the 0.5 threshold is hit as a function of time, what I see is this uh, decreasing behavior. This is the effective radius of the Dirac point. And this sort of makes sense if you think about um, a sort of uh, local band degeneracy I can force if I'm evolving my atoms very, very quickly, right? So we know that there's a Dirac point, that the band gap gets uh, smaller and smaller as you get closer to, to the direct point. But if I'm evolving my atoms fast enough relative to some to the band gap at some radius away from Q, uh, from the direct point, then effectively the bands look degenerate, okay? And uh, so that is why you would expect that uh, as you move faster and faster uh, near the direct point, you essentially stop seeing Landau's inner physics. You essentially stop seeing uh, the transitions that you uh, expect to see when you have some finite band gap. Okay. And uh, the last sort of big point that I wanted to talk about was us studying the uh, quadratic band touching point. So I mentioned for the direct point, we can start the atoms at gamma. We can move over to uh, the K point, which is the direct point and turn at some angle. We can do something similar uh, in the higher bands of the lattice. And I'm happy to sort of talk about that afterwards if people want to know the details of that. But in this Brillouin zone picture, one way to think about it, I realize it's a bit confusing, but one way to think about it is I start at gamma. Uh, I'm just going to assert that I can load my atoms into the third band okay, associated with this triangle, and I can keep them in the third band, and I can move them back towards gamma where the quadratic band touching point is. Then I can turn again by some angle theta, I can measure the relative population between atoms in the third band and the fourth band, right? Uh, here, the third band is red and the fourth band is the purple. And I can see how that, um, that relative population changes as a function of the turn angle, okay? So uh, sort of similar to the pseudo spin one half and a pseudo magnetic field picture that I spoke about for the direct point, you can imagine something similar for the quadratic band touching point. It's just that, as I make one full revolution around the gamma point, you see that the effective field wraps twice, right? So that tells you about this interesting topological feature of this gamma point. And that is what we see in the data, the fact that we see these two oscillations, right? Here and here, or in the third band data, here and here, 
this is telling us that there is something topologically interesting about this gamma point. If it was a topologically non-trivial point, we actually would see a flat line. So the fact that we see uh, a non-zero oscillation amplitude tells you that this, uh, this quadratic band touching point is topologically interesting. Okay. And so uh, we've been able to, uh, with this measurement, we, we've been able to directly measure this uh, winding number of two associated with a quadratic band touching point, um, you know, very different from the winding number of one associated with the direct point and the, the known pi berry phase. And so this tells us, as you might expect, that uh, there is a quantized berry phase associated with the quadratic band touching point. And I want to point out that this technique is quite useful because if you do um, some sort of interferometric experiment, uh, which is what the cold atom community tends to do with studying these interesting points in band structure, you wouldn't be able to see the quadratic band touching point uh, because you wouldn't be able to use interferometry to detect a, a phase of two pi, right? Two pi is um, indistinguishable from zero, but doing this quantum distance measurement that I've described to you, instead of uh, directly trying to measure a berry phase or the, the appearance of a two pi berry phase, is uh, incredibly clear that there's some uh, non there's some uh, some very interesting non-trivial topology at play when it comes to the gamma point. Okay, and so uh, we've reached my conclusion. Um, I want to conclude with the the fact or the opinion <laughs> uh, that an ultra cold atom quantum simulator is a powerful tool that allows for simulation of real materials or toy Hamiltonians, both interesting. Um, uh, measurements of quantum distance allow the non-trivial topology of direct points and quadratic band touching points to be directly revealed. And in our work, we've observed uh, these quantized wanting numbers of one associated with the direct point and two for the quadratic band touching point. Um, there's lots of different physics that we want to do with this. Uh, I, you know, there in the solid or in the condensed matter world, there's lots of uh, intrigue about flat band systems. And being that uh, we make an optical cosmic lattice like the, uh, the lattice, I believe, of ruthenium tri, 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 trichlorate, I think people study. Um, we we want to study five band physics. Uh, it's interesting, though, that in this hexagon lattice, given the, the non-issues with band hybridization, uh, in tight binding, the lowest P band, that is the third highest band from the ground band, is completely flat. So this is a nice, simple system um, for us to study flat band physics. And specifically, we're interested in like how bosons condense in these flat bands. And so we're hoping to move into uh, with this system, studying how uh, bosons might condense in this lowest P band. And this image is the sort of first, uh, one of the first measurements of us doing so. I mentioned how by studying the quadratic band touching point, we, uh, we load that into the third band, we evolve them over to the gamma point. Uh, well, this is an experiment where we've done that, but we've held them at the gamma point for it as a function of time. And we see that after some time, the atoms, uh, after some time, we do an image where we can resolve the uh, band distribution of the atoms. We find that they align themselves along the boundary of the third brilliant zone to make the star pattern. So uh, this is uh, just something that we're starting to get into now, uh, but thank you very much for your attention. Happy to take as many questions as we have time for. Well, thank you, Charles. So I can remind the audience uh, to send your questions to Charles either in the chat or the Q&A. So while we're waiting for folks to provide some questions, I do have a, a quick question, Charles. Was there a particular reason why you chose uh, rubidium for your um, honeycomb-like optical lattice uh, as opposed to cesium or some other alkali metal? Uh, no, only convenient. So, you know, this experiment has been running for a while and this is the atom that we use. Um, you know, in an ideal situation, we would have an atom like potassium, for example, or lithium that has a tunable Feshbach resonance that allows us to control the, the, the strength and a sign of the interaction between atoms. So for example, with potassium or lithium, you could pretty easily make attractive or repulsive atoms. And to study how 
the band structure, like the band touching point physics changes uh, with the nature of the interaction, that would be really interesting and something we hope to do in the future. But really, the answer to your question is out of convenience. <laughs> it's not. It's not easy to switch the atoms. Okay. So there was there was no subtle reason, you know, for using rubidium. It's just like just experimental convenience. Yeah. It's just we have a machine that can make rubidium bosons and condensates. Those are our atoms, so that's what we're using. But we're actually uh, so half of my job is to build a new experiment, and we're uh, building a dual species experiment that. Uh, will be both rubidium and potassium. And so we're hoping to study potassium fermions in the cognitive virus soon. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Let's see. So I, I have a question from the audience. Uh, how many cold atoms do we need to observe the band structure features? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, so what I'm showing you is, you know, it's band structure, so it's single particle physics. Um, I think the answer to your question comes down to like a signal to noise issue. Uh, in our experiments, uh, in, in these experiments, most of them were done with DECs, uh, boson sign condensates that have about 10,000 atoms. And when the atom number gets down to 2,000, maybe 1,000 or so, uh, the, the, the images that we take are not good enough for us to resolve any of this band structure dynamics business. So I would say our, our cutoff is sort of like 2000 atoms in our, in our condensate. We don't get enough diffraction from the lattice, uh, in order to, to see any of the, the physics that we want to see. I have a question from David Bell at Harvard. What's the, big, big, what's the biggest experimental difficulty in your research and what are the bottlenecks with your simulations? The biggest difficulty? Um, I would say maybe the temperature or the entropy. Uh, it's, it's hard to make these atoms much colder. A lot of the community is quite interested in studying, uh, say, phase diagrams. You know, maybe you want to study the... Uh, the Bose Hubbard, the Bose Hubbard or Fermi Hubbard models, but quite a bit of the parameter regime is inaccessible at the moment because we can't get our full atoms cold enough yet. So we need we need more techniques, different techniques to try to get atoms colder. Granted, there's still lots of very interesting physics to do without getting atoms colder, uh, but that's I think one of the biggest difficulties and one of the biggest bottlenecks. Um, I think in terms of but but another sort of bottleneck, maybe that's related to quantum simulation is um you know thinking about precisely what 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 quantum simulation is what it means how you benchmark um whether or not you can write down uh, a clean hamiltonian and then make your system be or engineer your system to be uh to have evolution that's modeled by the hamiltonian i mean that's that's a sort of uh uh, I think that's a difficult point to address. And um, I mean, I, maybe I don't have any more to answer there, but I, but I think it's, I think it's that. Okay. Other questions or comments? So I have a question with these graphene like optical lattices. Are there analogs for phonons, let's say two-dimensional phonons. And if there are, you know, can you suggest some ways to experimentally observe these? Yeah, so I know of one example that I'm totally not familiar with yet. Uh, but the Lev group at Stanford, uh, they've used a multi-mode optical cavity to, to generate what effectively looks like an optical lattice with phonons. Um, this is a pretty new development, a uh, very, very new development in the cold atom world. And I think it's gonna be super interesting to see what comes of this. But until very recently, um, there, I think maybe the community wasn't sure about how to go about it. Um, so I would, I would point you to Benjamin Lev's work at, at Stanford. Okay, okay. Yeah. So I have some That's more- a very important question. <laughs> so some more feedback from David Bell. He thanks you for your responses. 
and he wants to get some more information about the noise floor for your simulation. Um, uh, could, could you maybe follow up on that, uh, that, that question, David? Uh, what do you mean about the noise floor? Like, what about it? So I'm waiting for a response. So waiting, waiting to get a response from him in real time. While we're waiting, um, have you in your group looked at uh, Calgamy lattices in terms of optical lattices, or is that going beyond the honeycomb structure to to other types of structures? What what type of uh, progress can you report as speculation on those systems? Yeah. So in recent years, we've been sort of uh, mostly focused on the Calgamy lattice. Um, and the, the last, the last paper we have, uh, the PRL paper, I think from 2020, uh, about band structure renormalization in the cogway lattice. So, uh, in the cogway lattice, the, the third band, uh, in the, in the lowest S orbital bands is, is, uh, flat. But what we find is that given the, uh, atom atom interaction, the band structure is renormalized. Uh, and you, uh, you end up not seeing the flatness that you would expect to see. Um, you know, and it's part of the reason why in the future we want to be able to play around with interactions. Part of the reason why we want potassium is to be able to tune the interactions through many interesting regimes and uh, try to look at flat band physics in the cognitive lattice. Okay. So I've got David's response. Uh, it says that typically in such a simulation would have errors creeping in due to st stochastic noise. Is that due to the temperature issue? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, let me give you this. I mean, in order to, to do a measurement like what I'm showing here in the top and the, the direct point, you know, each one of these points is uh, generated by averaging a good amount of data and you know, sort of, this requires a sync, each one of those, those measurements that go into generating one of these points, say, say 10 measurements goes into generating one of those points, each measurement is an experimental shot. So that is, you know, a 40 second run of going from hot atoms in the oven to making a, a BEC and putting in the lattice, doing the lattice experiment. And we certainly find that from shot to shot of the experiment, um, we have some, some fluctuation. Uh, there are certainly some stochastic processes that come in and, you know, make taking measurements like that difficult. Um, but I think that we've been able to sort of uh, average our data in order to directly look at what we were hoping to study. That is this topological interesting point, uh, these, these two points, in a way that I think gets us away from noise floor problems. So I'm actually, I, I, unfortunately, I can't say too much about it, but I can say that we take these experimental shots and they're, they're mostly the same shot to shot. And we can uh, average away spurious fluctuations that come and might um, uh, not, a, not allow us to be able to see how the, the atoms are traversing through the different bands. Okay. So I have another question from Ioannis Petrides. Uh, Johannes wants to know, can the experiment implement models that break time reversal symmetry? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, we, so we don't do it, but it's, uh, there's been a lot of really interesting and important work in the cold atom world done with shaken lattices. So uh, if, you, if you shake your lattice, uh, you can introduce, um, you can make your hopping complex and you can do it in a way that um, makes it as though the atoms are picking up uh, a phase as they hop, a particular phase as they're hopping from site to site. And that looks like there's some magnetic field penetrating your lattice. So uh, the short answer to your question is yes, you can do it with lattice shaking, uh, um, but we just, we haven't done that in our experiment. So some feedback from David. He says, thanks very much, and says, compliments you on this very challenging work. 
Thanks. Other questions, comments from the audience? Okay, if not, then I'd like to thank Charles for a very exciting talk. And a reminder that our QMD seminar next week will be same time, same date, and a uh, poster will be coming out soon on the speaker and the abstract. Again, thanks very much to everybody. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Thank you.